Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Open Source and Business, a podcast or speaker series or interview series, however you want to call it, uh, where I, I talk to experts in the field of open source and um, how open source brings value to the business world um, beyond some of the topics that we explore more regularly. Um, so today I'm joined by Celeste Corgan, who is a staff technical, technical writer at CNCF, and by Anne Gentle, who's developer experience manager at Cisco DevNet. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thanks. Glad Thanks to be here. Me. And you just um, downed a cup of coffee before we started. That was impressive. <laughs> I did. Yeah, that was a, that was a, yeah shot size. That was the remainder All right. of, of my espresso. Um, and so we're we're going to talk about the value of documentation uh, because both of you are experts in the field of uh, technical documentation as it pertains to open source. And I know you've been working on this field for a long time. Um, and Celeste, you've been with the CNCF for several years at this point. Uh, just a couple of actually. I'll be at my two year anniversary in December. Uh, but I've been doing documentation for I think closer to seven or eight years now. I I don't keep track. <laughs> okay. And um, and Anne, you've written a couple of books on on the topic of uh, documentation and open source. There's Conversation and Community, which is the first book that I read uh, that uh, really spoke to the specific nature of documentation in open source projects. And your latest book is remind Docs me of like the title. Docs, Docs like, like code. Docs like code. Okay. Yeah, and that's more about how to collaborate with um, you know, like version control, like Git and using um, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment okay. for docs. So, so managing docs being, right alongside yeah. your, your code with the same workflows. Exactly. And yeah. it's very and it's being very right? humble. Yeah. Oh. And, and it's being very humble, which is in the world of technical documentation, this is a well known, well loved book which has changed many oh, minds wonderful. and shifted yeah, the field in this particular direction. So I'm personally happy to be here talking to Anne. I, it, I wouldn't have it without open source. I mean, OpenStack was the one setting up this amazing tool chain and this amazing group that was very collaborative. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think the book is out of open source. And I actually, I mean, I, my whole career is a trajectory thanks to open source. If I hadn't had a chance to kind of experiment with wikis because open source was using wikis, I wouldn't have written the first book, <laughs> you know? And so I, I just, it's a, it's a way to experiment with, you know, we're, we can be cutting edge in open source and, yep. and try things. And, you know, I, I think that's really relevant to business today too. Like, you know, yeah. try it out, see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I feel the same about open source as a writer. I think, so my my boss Chris Anishchik is like encouraging me to give this talk and write the talks, and I keep telling him, you know, Chris, I'm scared because it's not going to be a talk; it's going to be an angry rant, uh, and I don't know if I want to be that person like right out the gate. But you may see it. Um, and the talk is basically how like technical writers don't don't have a career ladder; we don't progress very well because we tend to work in these very isolated settings where we're the only writer on the team, we're the only writer on a small team. Um, and I feel exactly the same about open source for that same reason. Like it has given right. me exposure to talking on podcasts as an expert. It's given me exposure to doing media. It's given me exposure to like leadership skills and opportunities that technical writers don't typically have. Um, and you know, it's made me significantly more valuable to the recruiters kind of like polluting my inbox uh, <laughs> on LinkedIn. I say that kindly, it's very flattering yeah. actually. But um, it's better you know, than the opposite. It's better than the opposite. <laughs> it's true. Uh, but it's um, increasing the leadership abilities and the um, expertise of your technical writing staff is very hard to do in isolation, and it's very easy to do in open source. In my opinion. I'd love to so. talk a lot more about that later because I know we talked about it a little before we came on camera. Mm -hmm. um, of you know, the role of soft skills in, in being successful in an open source project. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and it's definitely something I want to dig into. But let me start with by asking you both, right? Clearly, documentation is one of the fundamental differentiators between successful and unsuccessful projects. Uh, projects with good documentation get broader adoption. Um, and their users are happier with, that, uh, with those projects than projects that don't have it. 
And yet, you know, time after time on surveys around around open source projects, we see that documentation, the lack of documentation or the lack of good documentation is one of the biggest criticisms or biggest needs of a project. So why is there this, this disconnect between um, the importance of documentation for project success and the relatively late investment in documentation that happens by the people who are building these open source projects? Do you want do you want to have a go at that first, Celeste, from your, your perspective? Ooh. So I mean the way I always explain this to developers, whether I'm working in open source or working kind of like in a private company, is when you're choosing a new language to work with, or when you're choosing a framework or a library that you want to incorporate to help out the thing you're trying to build, because your product manager has told you that's what you're building today. How do you choose? Uh, and the developers often go like, well, well I, I take a look to see what it can do. And if it can do the thing that I that I hope it can do. And I say, okay, so how do you, where do you go to look for that, doc, that information? And invariably then they go, oh, I mean, I look at the documentation. I look to see if the documentation describes the thing I'm trying to do close enough. So I'm like, okay, so when you choose a new project, you're choosing based on the documentation. And if it doesn't have the documentation, you can't choose it. Um, and then it clicks in their little heads. Sort of, I say that that's a little derogatory, I apologize. It clicks in their heads and they go like, oh, yeah, I guess I do need to write this or else nobody's gonna use my project. And I go, yeah. <laughs> um, right. I think maybe, I think there's, there's a lot of like focus on, um, particularly in open source, I think there's an attitude of like, if you're not committing code, uh, you're like a set a less valuable member of the project. And I think that extends just from like tech culture back all the way to the eighties probably. Um, but when you think about how people actually interact, particularly with open source, where there isn't a support organization that you can pay into to get that kind of information, um, the documentation becomes extremely valuable. So, okay. Anne, have you seen um, like the projects that are successful in getting early stage investment in docs and, and, you know, what kind of, is that typically led from the top down or is it uh, uh, like just the fact that the developers are conscious this is important? Well, I, I think you said a keyword there with investment, right? I mean, you know, you, you do, the thing about docs is it's actually difficult and you kind of have to sit your butt in a seat and write. And that is a, you know, a really difficult concept a lot of times for people to just understand the sheer magnitude of the work. Um, so investment means, okay, how can we make this sustainable? You know, it's, it's paying someone to do it probably. And then making sure that person is empowered with equality in the community, right? A doc's contribution is the same as a dev contribution. And that's a big deal too, right? It's just put everyone on the same playing field, probably the same tools. Like that, let's be real. That's why Docs Like Code really appeals to me is like, hey, I can get help from devs. And guess what? Devs can help with the documentation too. So, you know, that's right. that's a big deal. And it, and it, you know, it just breaks down silos. It's not any kind of, you know, throw it over the wall. You know, that's the kind of thing you want. And so I, I think, you know, like, to the first question, you know, why? It, it, it's because it's hard. <laughs> um, but anytime you look at something that's difficult, you also have to look at like, well, does the person even know how to do it? You know, and, and, and I think there's, there's a little bit of just uncertainty as well. How do I get started with docs? You could, you could spend six months just evaluating tool chains because that's the fun part, right? Um, you know, so there's just a lot of like, you know, it, it's just hard to find this like, sustainability i think is what i keep coming back to right um and and you know hey even if you didn't get it early on it's, it's always a good time to start and it's always a good time to revisit right, right. your docs mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. test them and get people in front of them and you know reinvigorate there's you know there's always a chance to do that so mm -hmm. but i don't know if i answered your second question well so let me put it this way when is the best time for a technical writer to get involved in a project? Is it before any code is written so that you're writing like like what Celeste mentioned before we, again, before we came on camera of uh, documentation driven development where you write the docs to, to describe the behavior that the user should see and then have developers code to that? Or 
you know, um, I mean, the more common pattern is that you get involved once there is something that exists and you're uh, kind of trying to, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, I don't know what the right question is, but like there's this early, early stage mm -hmm. work, which is part design, part product marketing and part technical documentation. And which is the most, like, which do you typically attack first, I guess? Can or I give you a the... spicy answer to your question? Can I get controversial? I, <laughs> yeah. So Go I away. think... I think that software as a field struggles with, um, I think it struggles with its hidden creativity. And I think when you look at developers as a group of people, the thing, so I went to art school, I went, my degrees in design. Um, and I just got into this cause I'm a nerd. Um, so <laughs> The thing that always strikes me when I step into like a new team of software developers um, is that it, it's such a creative way of working. It's so just like deeply, deeply creative. It is as creative as any art studio I've ever been in. Uh, but I think developers are in, a bit in denial about that. Um, and I think when you look at modern software practices and I include Agile in this um, in the statement, uh, I think it's it's trying to sort of mask creativity for lack of a better word. Um, and I think when you look at documentation, I think when you look at QA and like automated testing, um, and I think when you look at CICD as practices, that's really funny because those are all so regimented comparatively. Like documentation cares very much about what is the truth of the system. Um, test-driven development also cares very much about what is the truth of the system. And to a certain extent, CICD pipelines are kind of in that same um, realm. And so I think, like, inherently, for example, writing the documentation before you actually start developing makes a lot of sense. And I think people understand it makes sense. Um, I think it's the same with test-driven development. It's like you have to outline the, the boundaries of the system before you can understand how it's supposed to perform. Right. Um, but I think that like the people who actually go into software development and are very passionate about it are actually like deeply creative and a bit like loosey goosey for back of a better word. And so they rebel against it because it's a very regimented way of working, which I completely understand, but you know, uh, just embrace the creativity and then work around it in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I mean, I, I, that's kind of what agile does. Like, two week sprints, you know, all this discipline of daily standups, you know, and so that it's almost like you hear waterfall is the, you know, regimented way. And it's like, you do agile really, really in a dedicated way. Right. It's super, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Lots of rails in place. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, it's like the difference between, you know, planned cities where you have like the Le Corbusier idea of the garden city with the green belts mm -hmm. and, and, and then you've got the Jane Jacobs kind of neighborhoods growing organically or Christopher Alexander neighborhoods growing organic organically and you plan around interconnections between them and you kind of mm -hmm. you try and make sure that each neighborhood is its own autonomous cell. And I feel yeah. like, mm -hmm. you know, that's almost the, you know, monolithic development versus microservice development or mm -hmm. uh, waterfall versus agile. It's yeah. like, yeah. You know, well, an API um, design, like there's there's really great rigid specifications, right? And those have evolved over time. But if you can have someone who's really into words and really into user experience and developer experience, get a look at that design early, you know, they're going to recognize, especially if there's two or more teams working on something like, hey, they have a login as well as you who gets the actual word yeah. login you know there's a lot of like precious commodity in the actual words people get to use mm -hmm. so someone mm -hmm. it doesn't even have to be a tech writer now the tech writer is going to be good at it right but you know in api design who's just a good word nerd anybody who's just a good recognizer of detailed patterns um and someone who can just advocate for the user like you know yeah. look no user is going to know what you mean when you say that can can you let's try to rephrase or yeah Let's, but I think I think sort of like moving doc yeah, I think moving documentation sort of up to the left, if you will, um, in the process, I think there's also sort of like that that hierarchy comes into play again of like, you know, 
the most important people in the room are the software developers uh, and the marketers or the technical writers or the QA people or the support people, well, like they're downstream. So we don't consider them early in the process. Um, and I think that's a very like dangerous way of existing. Um, like the more diverse opinions you have in the room and the more you're able to equalize those opinions, um, the more complete the design of anything you're going to do is going to be, the less, you know, the less rakes you're going to step on if you have more people to look for rakes. Um, but, but it's a hard sell for some, for some people in this field. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. do you find yourself when you're joining a project for the first time, do you find yourself writing more or editing more? Like I imagine as a technical writer that uh, like, you're not necessarily an expert in the project that you're working on, certainly not the first day you start working on it. So do you like, is your first job? Well, let me try and install this. Let me figure out how to use it. Let me figure out where all of the uh, rakes are, as you were, as you were saying, um, or is it, you know, let I'm going to, you know, spend all this time talking to the developers so that I know what they're trying to do. And then I'll write what they tell me. What's the, what, what would you say is your best approach? First approach. Well, and you know, there's a great talk. Um, in, so the write, write the Docs community is this wonderful community of developers and writers who, you know, work really hard on making open source documentation better. And here's the thing, a lot of people want to figure out, well, how do I approach an open source project? And I really want to work on one, but I don't know how to get started. And so there's this great talk and we can put it in the show notes um, by Abigail McCarthy. But it's like, you know, she's like, why don't you pick some goals for why you want to contribute? And then, you know, does the culture match for the goals of the project you're looking for? Because then you're going to be a lot more motivated if you kind of picture why, like, why am I even working on this, you know? And so it, it you know, make sure that matches up for sure. Cause culture is so important in open source. It's a very people powered, you know, environment shall we say, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and, and I, I mean, in my personal my personal way would be looking at their bug backlog. Like I love to check boxes. That's one of my favorite things, you know? So I just personally know where my approach would be. And then I'd be, I mean, I'm, I'm trying things mm -hmm. out, right? I'm like, does it actually run? Do I need to log a bug, you know? So, yeah. you know, that's, that's my approach. But I yeah. love this talk, definitely highly recommend. Yeah, there's, um... The CNCF community is a bit of a unique one uh, because it's so many projects large. I think the Priyanka gave a count at KubeCon last week, a couple of weeks ago. I think we're at 144 projects now uh, and there are three paid writers, three to four of us, uh, which is a lot, a lot of project and not a lot of writer. Um, so at the CNCF, the approach we're taking is a lot more editing based just because we have mm -hmm. to spread ourselves somehow. Um, it's not the ideal approach, I think, for a lot of writers. And I think that's actually where a lot of the disconnect for writers getting involved in open source comes in, is when you're working kind of in a private company as a writer, you're often pairing very closely with a product team. Like you're attending their standups, you're looking at their sprints, you're looking at the tickets as they move across the board, and you're saying that one, that one, that one, that one. Okay, you five developers, let me throw you into a room and like, let's, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about the docs. Uh, we don't necessarily have that luxury in the scenes or in the CNCF ecosystem. So it is a lot more editing based for that reason. Um, but yeah, I think there's a disconnect between how writers typically work and how open source works, where there's like this super high level of autonomy for developers um, that I do not know the solution for. Uh, but one of the things on my plate is to attempt a solution for, and I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> I'm curious, you, you mentioned there's three people paid to work on docs. Is that across the entire CNCF ecosystem, or is that specifically by the CNCF itself? That is uh, people who are directly employed by the CNCF in some okay. manner, uh, so including myself. So do you have myself. people working on technical docs who are part of the, the member ecosystem as well? Um, yes, but they're, they're not necessarily technical writers. Um, sometimes they're very senior developers, uh, sometimes they're DevRel, but, and they're, um, sort of scope of work also includes community management. It also includes their code of conduct. It also includes like CI CD pipeline management. Um, we do have a couple of technical dedicated technical writers and I think they floated off. They were from Amazon and I think they floated off to open telemetry at some point, but I haven't heard from them in a while. Um, okay. 
it's hard to sort of keep technical writers around. Like one of the struggles we have as an ecosystem is like how how do you pair writers with projects? Um, and a part of how we're trying to solve that is like how do you help a project get ready for a writer? Because a lot of projects aren't ready just yet. They're uh, they're not quite organized, for lack of a better word. Yeah, the reason I asked is because I think one of the things that I've seen and do in, in, and I don't know whether this was deliber deliberate or what, I think it was deliberate, but I don't know whether it was deliberate or whether it was incidental. Uh, when you were leading the documentation efforts for OpenStack was, was to really spend a lot of time on community management almost for documentation and yeah. like making sure you were connected to you all really the people do. who were working on docs. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you're having, the hardest part right now would be 18 months of COVID. I mean, I was able to have in-person sprints we got to know each other we you know that mm -hmm. it, it has to be mm -hmm. even harder when it's remote mm -hmm. as well but mm -hmm. i mean and the thing is like in in cisco devnet i have a docsis code cicd system where we're enabling almost 2000 people within cisco so it is very similar to that coordination effort i have a very tiny but mighty team that's centralized that is bringing in all of these developer docs right so there's these kind of these kind of like um triage prioritize you know, find small bits of work that people can do and the amount of time they have, you know, sometimes you only get somebody for six months. Well, what work can they do? Uh, we use, you know, we use checklists. Um, there's just a lot of like content governance that you end up doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's, what's even a product goes end of end of support or end of life or end of sale. So, you know, we're, we're looking, and, and honestly, I'm looking for more ways to automate it all the time, right? Give me an API. Any, any API will help. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's just sort of the business of any incremental pieces of work, I think. Um, and, and you're going to find it, you'd find it in QA, you'd find it in, you know, dev backlogs as well. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about how you justify adding a, um, a writer to a project. Um, because I imagine, you know, at some point somebody hires somebody, right? And they, they realize that the, the money that it's going to cost to pay somebody to work full time on documentation is going to be worthwhile. Uh, so how do you like, what, what types of measures do you use to measure like how effective you're being or the value you're being to being to a project? And, you know, have you ever had to put together a business case for hiring a new person or convincing somebody to hire you for a project? Mm -hmm. I mean, the luxury of my current sort of role in our current team is that um, somebody else makes the business case for us. And it's usually the projects themselves or the board. Um, and that's actually how my position was created. Uh, was the project said, we want a writer. Uh, and so a writer was found. <laughs> um, so this is actually uh, something that I think the CNCF can maybe work on or that I think needs to be worked on is right now there's a bit of a disconnect between the technical oversight committee approving projects to be in the CNCF um, and the CNCF's ability as staff to scale to that. Um, which is the more projects you approve, in theory, somehow, somehow those services need to scale. And automation will take you so far, but there comes a point where you just need headcount. And writing, for lack of a better um, way of doing it, uh, is a manual process. It is a person process. So at some point, you do need headcount for writing. Um, and so I think that's kind of like the next frontier, uh, is how do you define the scalability model for an organization like the CNCF, where it's like, as X number of projects exist, Y number of services exist. Um, yeah. And um, I, I've done it recently with you know, talking about a small but mighty team. You know, I actually started measuring capacity. This is how many teams we can help publish. This is how many new docs we brought on board. This is how many we updated. And we would give it like a small, medium, large. So you do a one, two, three, you get out your spreadsheets, you figure out your capacity, you know. Uh, but I mean, metrics wise, you know, you can do it a couple ways with like how many support tickets were actually not, you know, there's a lot of companies have how much does each support the ticket cost you? Did I not have to hire a support engineer because the docs deflected that, that, you know, um, I think that especially for developer documentation, it's going to be fairly easy to like figure out adoption. Um, and man, if you have interactive docs where they're actually able to do API calls and you can tie in, you know, how many API calls they're doing or how many like practice keys or developer keys 
people came and got from your docs, like you're going to find a lot of really good metrics just for, you know, that that's your, that's your pirate metrics, the adoption rate, the, right. you know, how, how, how much are they getting involved? Because that should, ha that should let you have a metrics flow that says, mm -hmm. Hey, this doc got people to try it, got people to yeah. do something. Yeah. Right. In yeah. the CNCF ecosystem, yeah. I would say the metric is probably more around like how projects are moving through that graduation cycle. Um, and because docs is a huge part of the evaluation for that, like the two big pieces are like kind of how diverse is your contributor base, how many companies do you have contributing, and sort of how re reasonably speaking, how polished is your website and your box? Um, how complete are they? Do you have like case studies from end user companies? Um, that kind of thing. Um, nice. So that's kind of our, our metric of choice is, is the work we're doing directly leading to sort of more projects getting closer to incubating okay. from sandbox or graduating from incubating. Um, the interesting thing about documentation in regards, because what Anne is describing, I think are like traditional documentation metrics of success. Like, did we deflect a support ticket? Um, is there high interaction in the docs? Like, are we publishing lots of docs? Do we feel like we have high completion? Um, Aside from the completion piece, you don't really have access to the other two, which are actually very important for documentation groups. Um, you have no idea how many support tickets have been deflected because there is no support organization in open source, right? Um, there is no formal support organization anyways. Um, and you have no, well, like you have an idea of like how many people are sort of interacting with stuff, um, but you I, have no I, idea. I remember, what that, uh... Sorry. I had a fun time grepping through IRC logs at one point and I was looking right? for um, getting started and install. <laughs> yeah. Like just this yeah thing, like, I was going to say Slack know, is kind of yeah. like your your support portal um, insofar really, as the project is concerned. Um, really I think you look, support, yeah. Door, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think when you look at yeah. something like Kubernetes um, where you have or like large organizations like VMware or like Red Hat who are heavily investing in sort of managed Kubernetes distributions um that's a slightly different metric um and i actually wonder if there is a metric you could derive around like how many of these sort of like managed distributions exist around a particular project which is indicative of its success and indicative of the fact that companies feel they can build out and finance these teams because their people can find the answers in your docs but that's a bit fuzzy <laughs> yeah yeah, it's it's interesting to get that like the dichotomy of like maturity based or completion based metrics versus you know business value based metrics mm -hmm. and, and and yeah, it's interesting to to like you're right in a lot of open source projects we just don't have access to to the the kind of even just adoption metrics and whether people are and I guess there's the the user surveys that all of all of the projects we're involved in uh, do where we can you know we can see oh documentation went down this year cool fewer people are complaining about it but and i and i was gonna say you know the opposite can happen too where if your docs do start to get complained about that then that lets you act hopefully right to justify addition um yeah right but um, yeah because I, I do remember you know the open stack board was very supportive when there were just tons of complaints about install. <laughs> right. So I had a contract writer, you know, it was, it was a good, it was a good reaction. So, you know, it's also just measuring when things are really tanking. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, <laughs> it does sometimes feel like post-processing though. It's, it's like, yes, we're, um, yes, know, we're calling that's in lagging. The, you know, we're calling indicator. in the doctor when yeah. somebody is on their deathbed type thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's probably not I mean, that's always the issue. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of always the issue with docs, right? And as you and I were talking, Dave, before we got like on the call, like I think most places tend to underinvest in documentation and there's a few sort of key types of businesses that don't. And I think the, the exemplary type of business that typically invests well in documentation is a software as a service API. So Stripe or Twilio, API business first. models like that, where, yeah, yeah, where the product is the API dot, it's closed source. You have no idea what you're getting back except that API call, um, meaning the documentation is the interface to the API. Uh, and these companies tend to typically realize that and they invest very heavily in their documentation. However, again, as we were saying uh, before and joined us, um, 
they seem to also go through cycles because documentation is viewed as a cost center rather than as product development. Uh, and this is the key problem where you see, you know, Stripe had a kind of great five or 10 year start, five year, we'll say, it's not that old. Uh, they had a kind of great first five years with their documentation, like incredibly fabulous. They had this rock star team. It went to seed for three or four years and now they're investing heavily in documentation again because they realized their, their documentation is not looking as good as it used to. Um, and I remember diving into those docs two or three years ago with a new manager of mine at, as what I thought would be a positive example and then going like, oh, things have changed. <laughs> like, uh, and now they're investing yeah. very, you know, they're starting to invest very heavily in their writing teams again because they realize it's the interface. Um, and again, I think there's, there is a fundamental attitude problem around documentation in most businesses and it's the idea of it's support, it's a cost center, we have to do it at some point, whatever, here you go. And that's not what it is. It is a key member of a product development team. And if you that's treat it like word. that, um, you will have greater success. It's one of the things that uh, Kathy Sierra has written extensively about. It's the idea that, you know, you, you get the glossy brochure before you buy the product and then you buy the, like we were talking about SLR cameras, uh, you buy the SLR camera and the manual is kind of this drab, like this, it's like text and buttons, and you're like, I I don't know how to work this thing. I'm I'm I I can I I can't figure out how to make it auto focus or whatever. <laughs> um, and the difference between before and after is is kind of um, stark. Yeah. And, and to that point, I mean, you mentioned uh, user case studies, right? Um, and you mentioned wik wikis earlier. Um, the potential scope for a technical writer in a project is so broad, you could end up doing product marketing or sales enablement docs, um, or you know, ma maintaining the website copy, um, mm -hmm. maintaining user case studies. Where do you, where do you limit yourself? What, what types of things do you focus on? Like at, at what point do you say, this is not my job anymore? The website's not my job. There's a, you know, a web design, a website maintainer that does that. I'm going to focus on API docs and user docs. I don't know. I'm, I'm like, where, well, where, I, I mean, I think, like, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the struggle, right? Because documentation means something different to a lot of different people too. Like I usually have a website in my head currently, but you just pulled out a manual, right? And that is what's in somebody else's mind is something different, right? And then, you know, the last time I bought a camera, they offered me free classes, right? So then there's the whole training aspect. Maybe you're mm -hmm. going to go make videos. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, I think that you you have to listen to your users. You have to figure out where they are. And I think that happens a lot, you know, in developer communities. Where are they already? What do they prefer? I mean, uh, my kid learned Minecraft on videos. I hate watching videos to learn yeah, anything, yeah. you know. And so it, it really is about, okay, who's your audience? What are they trying to get into? And then you probably have to tailor it to them and, you know, figure out what they need. Mm -hmm. So anyway, because documentation is so broad, don't limit yourself, figure out what mm -hmm. your users need and then find a way to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of like documentation, like technical documentation for software, like if you take that as a really strict definition, I think it's about what you're describing are like expanding spheres of influence really. And I think like the core sphere there is, is the product 100% documented? Yes or no. And if you're, core product is not 100% documented, stop there. That's where you stop yourself. That's the baseline. You have to document it. It has to be documented accurately. It needs to be updated with every release. When you've sort of satisfied that core requirement, well, then you can expand outwards and say, well, there's training that needs to be done. Uh, we need, need to write case studies. Um, if you're an open source, it's like, have we documented our community engagement methods? Like one thing that I mentioned to projects almost every time I do a review with them is, have you actually advertised when your community meetings are? Because if you don't publish your community meetings, you can't expect people to join them. <laughs> like, you know, just really basic things like that. And that's kind of the next sphere of influence is you think about the documentation within the system of the project, right? And then the next sphere of influence is out is when you get to marketing and sales enablement and to a certain extent DevRel, but I think DevRel is actually the same in that it traverses those spheres of influence where it's like, how do we market the product? And does that actually correspond down to the truth of the product? Um, 
Are we communicating the product value effectively based on what you know as a documentation person? And it's like you only get out there when you've satisfied the first two rings and then you're in that third ring of like the product and to a certain extent the company in the world. Okay. Um, so that's how I think of it anyways. And then like when you're thinking about uh, documentation and prioritization, do you focus on jobs people want to do or do you focus on documenting like interface point by interface? I mean, I, I gave a whole talk I mean, about this. You could look at, yeah, do you, oh, you go, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna find a link to my talk and we'll uh, we'll put it in the show notes. I can but, find a link um, to your talk while you're responding if you'd like. Uh, you know, I, I already got it. Um, oh, nice. So there you go. I, so I gave a talk at KubeCon, uh, the last KubeCon EU, uh, which is basically the basics of how to document, how to do the documentation, because uh, this is the question that I get asked all the time by a hundred odd projects. Um, it's a user focused look. So you're concerned with the jobs to be done aspect of it for sure. Uh, but documentation tends to fall into like three broad types of things you might be writing, which is conceptual. What is it? How does it, what is it and why do I care? Uh, task, how do I do it? Uh, and reference, okay, I've done it. And now I need to alter one weird little thing that I might be the only person who needs to alter. How do I do it? Where's my, so where's my like little cheat sheet? Um, so start with jobs to be done and like start with like, what does your user actually care about? Uh, then figure out what categories of things you need to write and then, you know, do the hard task of actually doing the writing. Um, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. That's the sit your butt in the seat. It's the sit your butt <laughs> in the seat, which is truly the most difficult part. Um, I described this to a good friend of mine uh, in the Kubernetes community. And I was like, yeah, you know, like, Writing's like, it's it's a cool thing to do for work. Like you, I sit myself down and then I start writing and it's really bad. And then I have to like force myself to continue and you like, like puke it out and it's horrible and you hate it, but at least it's on paper. And then at some point you have to like revisit it and reread everything you wrote and make it make right. sense. And I was like, it's fine. Like, it's a great, it's a great job for people who are self-deprecating. <laughs> 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 uh -huh. But yeah, it's it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult. So I know I'm gonna hate this. I had to write it down. Yeah. Anyway. Oh no. Oh no. One hundred percent. Like it's just a yeah. pure exercise in self-loathing. Okay. <laughs> so so like, um, in terms of like understanding behaviors and and uh, like the jobs to be done, do you, do you prefer doing editing of what other people have written? Then I mean that sounds mm -hmm. like what you're saying, uh, Celeste. It depends, <laughs> it depends. Um, sometimes it's easier to start from scratch. Sometimes it's easier to edit. Um, and there are pros and cons to both of those, I think. Okay. Do you want to add anything, Anne? So I've been playing around with a lot more like kind of, you know, natural language processing and God, I love those as editors. It, it's just like, it's gonna catch stuff I never caught, you know, um, give me that any day. I, I think I find him kind of very tedious. <laughs> but I, and I guess I'd also rather write. I'd I'd rather poke around with something and write. But you know, one thing I was thinking is like um, the um, season of docs, the where you know people can go find a project that needs help with documentation. Um, started by Google, right? And um, I was actually going through. So I, I sort of run a board um, at. Austin Community College and they have a TechCom certificate, right? And, you know, part of what we as like this board bring is what, you know, what do people need to learn in technical writing today? And, you know, I was looking through that list of, of open source projects because I feel like that, like I said, that's the future. That's where people are experimenting and, you know, doing what's happening now in, in technical writing. And the, there was a quite a variety of projects. Some were video that, that surprised me a little bit. Um, some of it was, um, you know, we have a bug backlog, help with this. Um, but there were also really innovative, you know, projects and a lot of them were docs as code um, as the tool chain, right? Which was also what I was trying to prove to this board. Um, but it just, you know, it just goes to show you that any individual open source project might have a different need at any given time and their maturity 
um, where their project is. Um, and that meta documentation idea of like document how you work on this, any newcomer is going to have the freshest eyes. They're going to recognize the things like, I don't even know where to join your meetings. You know, um, that's, yeah. that's gold. You're only that new VI for a while, like two weeks, maybe, I don't know, yeah. but yeah, harness that when you have that fresh, uh, perspective. Yeah. yeah. I, I like a, a line a colleague said is your newest users are the people who have, who are experiencing everything you've already forgotten. Absolutely. Who know everything you've already forgotten. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's talk about those soft skills that we were talking about earlier. Um, so one of the things that, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? David, um, I should remember this. David Eaves um, wrote about, said about the Mozilla community is um, at the time is that, you know, open source communities value this technical expertise above all. And yet, if you look at the most successful open source contributors, they're the people who have the soft skills, the, the, the project management skills, the interpersonal relationship skills, the conflict resolution skills, the negotiation skills, that the soft skills are uh, what differentiates between success and non-success. And uh, Celeste, you were saying that there's like, there is a tech primacy in the open, uh, kind of culture in, in open source. And yet I, I feel like it's been evolving. Do you, do you both agree? And um, like, what what are some of the things that you look for in technical documentation that are beyond just good writing? I mean, that conflict resolution piece that you came um, up with is so key because when you really think about it, um, open source uses the worst possible communication tools for actually understanding other people uh, and the ones which will introduce the most unintentional conflict. So GitHub comments, like how easy is it to interpret GitHub comments poorly? How easy is it to leave a GitHub comment, which is like kind of mean, kind of short, kind of rude. I work on the code of conduct committee for the Kubernetes project as well. So like I'm bringing a bit of a different lens to this, um, but it's the same with Slack. Like how easy is it to misinterpret somebody's Slack messages, right? Um, so I think being able to healthily receive something that's like a little bit short when like somebody being a bit short with you and say like, Hey, we don't talk to people like that in this project that comes across as a little rude, but the thing you said was valid and here's how we can maybe work through it is like super key. Um, documentation is it's a, a team sport. Uh, and B it is all of writing is a matter of opinion on some level. Uh, and, if you are writing in documentation out in the open, you are going to come across people who have different opinions than you and there will be no resolution. So the other thing that's key is sort of having a, a hard coded governance way of resolving conflicts of opinion. Um, but also having the maturity to navigate that without like table flipping is really important. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, just that there's just a lot of like calm, ability to just kind of approach everything with curiosity and not reaction, I think, um, is, is probably a really good trait to have, especially in open source. Um, I, I always look for someone who just wants to learn anything, right? I mean, that's just such a good trait in a, in a technical writer, full stop, just mm -hmm. learn anything, learn it quickly, write it down, you know, and, and that's just super, super valuable. Um, and, and, and that is curiosity as well. So, you know, there's sort of the curiosity of, well, do they really mean to sound rude or, you know, or even just yeah. getting curious, like, why did that make me so angry? I want to reach through my screen, you know, getting curious about yourself too. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a, that's a long journey. I mean, you know, but yeah. it is that, that skill set of just, am I managing my own emotion? Am I trying to figure out someone else's perspective and then having good judgment on, what my next action is and yeah. Does yeah. the does that aspect of like there being so many potential skills to learn or to bring to bear in a documentation role, does that contribute to them like people having trouble pigeonholing you and figuring out what career you're in? Or <laughs> you know, you were you were saying there's there's not a, a kind of a, an obvious career path. So yeah. I, I imagine that you know document like like community managers uh, you know, I've been a community manager for a long time, and I like community managers. You've got community managers and developer relations and documentation all kind of end up 
kind of what do you do again? <laughs> yeah, totally. 100%. I think, you know, where I think a lot of docu people in documentation maybe struggle with that open source skill set of, again, just consensus building and, and sort of relationship management and managing decisions in, in non-authoritative ways, really. Um, where I actually think they, that struggle, there's a struggle for technical writers is a lot of technical writers are fairly introverted people. Uh, they choose writing as as a career path for a reason. Uh, and I think it takes, at least that's something that I've noticed as I've sort of hired for the team that I'm on, it takes a very specific kind of personality to succeed in open source and not all writers have it. Um, you have to be pretty personal. You have to be willing to have the conversation. Um, I think a lot of writers can develop it. I think there are maybe a lot of writers who are like looking for a path to something more than what they're doing right now. But like, again, technical writing is a bit of an odd career choice in that regards too, so. <laughs> how, yeah, how about you, Adam, your career? Have you, seen, have, have, <laughs> yeah. have you seen people having difficulty kind of placing you in a role because you've come from this technical writing as a background? Or have you seen that as an asset that you've kind of been able to navigate because you've brought so many skills to bear? Well, I was going to say, ask five technical writers how they got into technical writing, and you'll get very five different, different answers. interesting answers, right? <laughs> I had a technical writer working for me who had, you know, basically been a navigator on a yacht for like six months. Like, you'll get everything. It's really, it, it, yeah, it's just very interesting career paths. And I think that's, you know, just part of the exploration and I'll learn anything and, you know, um, become good at something, right? Um, become an expert is really, is really important. Okay. Uh, so just to finish up, I'm interested whether you see, um, both of you, um, a trend in the open source world towards um, evaluating, like putting more focus, putting more emphasis on documentation, whether it's been a, have you, have you seen things change over the last decade uh, in terms of the attitude of, of uh, companies who are investing in open source and the, the people who are uh, hiring for open source projects, whether whether they're more likely now to invest in pet technical documentation and hire um, somebody for, for a role like that than they were a decade ago? I know it's a focus for the CNCF and I think it's become an increasing focus for the CNCF. And I know that frankly, the CNCF is a bit of a um, gravitational well for open source these days in particular. Uh, so I, I like to think it's gonna start becoming a bit more of a trend. Um, I think there's a lot of companies investing very heavily in DevRel, particularly if they're in dev tooling. And I think that also influences uh, greatly the value of documentation, particularly in dev tooling focused companies. So I think there's a bit of a shift happening. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I think what I've seen in open source is moving towards the foundation and then that, you know, lets it be a centralized service. And then you are spreading it spreading the good practice, you know, spreading the, the best, um, why, why it matters, why good documentation is going to get you somewhere. Right. But I also really agree with the DevRel thing. Like, the, you know, the developer world really, really leans on open source and, you know, is that's an, an aspect that they desire in anything they use. Right. And so I think that is going to lend itself you know, really well, it weaponize the documentation, right? I mean, uh, you don't have to use all military, you know, but uh, it, it is it is a way to just make your developer experience stand out, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a pretty, you know, and it, it, it really is the product is the docs. Okay. Yep. Yep. So would you both agree then that um, uh, kind of documentation is a key differentiator that like, I, I said it as a statement, as a kind of a statement of fact at the start, but is, is like, Good document is good documentation a requirement for success. I once had a I once had a partner who said, and he was a solutions architect, so he implemented things for customers. I once had a partner who said, I if I am choosing an open source project and the open source project's documentation is a GitHub README, I will not choose the project. I don't care if it's the best tool for the job. I don't care if it does everything I need it to do. I don't care if it's updated every two hours. I can't put that in front of clients. That's not professional. That's not what somebody who's paying hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to implement something wants. Uh, and 
So yes, I think it is. I think professional grade documentation um, is a huge differentiator. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay. Well, I'd like to um, thank you both for joining me today. This has been uh, brilliant. I'm uh, I'm still catching up from Open Source Summit in Seattle. I have a couple of highlight videos that I'm working on, and I have an interview that I did with Angela Brown on the importance of events for uh, for open source right. communities. As oh, we, Angela's we delightful. To get back into. Yeah, she she was. Um, and as we're getting back into in person events, it's it's like it's really kind of striking how much people have missed seeing each other, but also how exhausting it is to go back to it after a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. That's my my next couple of uh, sessions on, on open source and business. So thank you both for joining me today. I'll be getting this up on YouTube um, shortly. Okay. And I, will, I hope to see you both soon. All right. Oh, thanks thank so you much. so much for having us. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. My pleasure. All right. Have a good night or afternoon. <laughs> Have a good afternoon. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye now.